I'm sure that um, probably pulpits everywhere, if people are remotely in tune with what's going on, will be talking a lot about the subject, which maybe for some seems so far removed, but the subject of the week, at least in the circles of people that I encountered, was about the death of a certain television personality by taking his own life. And although that's not my message, um, I was kind of disturbed. I had gone online looking at some of the Christian commentary on this subject. And what disturbed me, I'm going to tell you. Not only from the people who um, cowardly, um, in cowardice, they post things and then they run away like little mice to hide somewhere, but equally the pastors. No one knows what is hiding underneath the facade of the people you encounter. Nobody. You see people and they look, they look great, they look happy. No one knows. And it's nobody's business to say someone's lifestyle or they have a good life or they don't have a good life. Maybe the people who are rich are really poor. And maybe the people who are really poor are truly the rich ones. But the thing that I've been saying, which I've been saying for weeks, months, probably years, is the change in our society that has much to do with a lack of God awareness. And that is just, that is not to say that the people of God are not tempted by the same type of demons that people who don't know God, you can't go there. Because I've known a few Christians in my life who unfortunately, even though they knew the Lord, decided they couldn't bear living in this world and took matters into their own hands. So all I will say to you as your pastor and as somebody who has definitely over the years been touched and seen many super spiritual idiots talk about things as if there's a special law that we should all be aware of. Well, the only law that I know of is the law of living life which is unpredictable. And the very people that you see one day, you may not see them again tomorrow. It may not be suicide. It may be an accident. It may be something else. We don't know. That's why I tell you, embrace, redeem. And probably the greatest thing which over the years I have even grappled with myself is try every day to look at the day as a gift from God and if it didn't go so well, know that the sun's going to come up tomorrow and a fresh and new gift is promised. You get to the end of the day, like a very wise man once said, you don't quit at night. And you latch on to the things of God, which in the worst of times will sustain you. Now, that was just a footnote kind of to say some people come in and they're all disturbed and they... They're expecting me to spend an hour on that subject, but what I will say in the next hour could be helpful to anybody at any place, at any circumstance, because when life does become overwhelming, we do have to remind ourselves of some few things that I think pay off, although it's difficult in the moment. People talk about certain things in the Bible, a God of Abraham. Well, the God of Abraham is still the God that's at work and orchestrating today, just differently. I say differently because God did things at a set time in a different way. When I say differently, he showed himself before he sent his only begotten son. He showed himself differently in those times. But the God of Isaac, who continues to be the same, and if you travel through the book, in the New Testament, Paul says essentially what 
all of the Old Testament is saying the same God who raised up Christ from the dead. In other words, hasn't changed, is, was, and will be, shall so dwell in you. Now, these things are easy to forget when life is rolling in. That's why I said we're people of the book. Um, I had them sing that song because through the week I was meditating on a scripture out of the book of Lamentations. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. It does take people who will exercise faith. It's very easy to fall prey to the mindset there is no help for me. And there are plenty of people in this book, if we keep studying it long enough to realize there are a plethora of people in the book who thought God might not do it for me. He did it for somebody else. He might not do it for me. In fact, a saying of a, an individual in the Old Testament caught my eye, and that pretty much became the launching pad for what I'm going to talk about today. In, don't turn there, but in 2 Kings 2 and verse 14, the prophet Elisha asks, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Just pause on that for a minute. I wish I had this knowledge many years ago. And I wish I had this insight many years ago. Thank God Elisha didn't say, oh my God, where is Elijah? He asked where the Lord God of Elijah was. In other words, he was focused on the master, not the servant. And too many of us spend a lot of time with eyes in the wrong place. And the reason why there is no hope or hope doesn't seem to come is when you're focused in the wrong place, eyes on the servant and not the master. You're asking the wrong person for help. You don't need a middleman. This isn't some negotiated job where you've got to find someone to do your interceding for you, we go directly and go boldly to the throne of grace. We're given that wonderful dispensation. In God's word, it says this is the way of the New Testament. Now, the question that Elisha asked was immediately after he had seen Elijah be taken up. And I can understand he just lost a spiritual friend, and perhaps he lost what might have been tantamount to a spiritual father. But he didn't say, Lord, where is Elijah? He asked, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And this is probably the most important message for each and every one of us today. If you came into this building, or you're listening in the sound of my voice, and something has rocked your world a little bit, it's real easy to look in the wrong place for the source of strength. And the power that comes with calling and talking to the right person. You know, another thing a wise man once said is, don't talk to God's angels when you can talk to God. You ever have a problem somewhere? You know, you've done a, some type of a business deal. You've done something, and you, you have to call some phone number and you get put on hold with 20,000 different people in different departments. I remember Dr. Scott saying, don't talk to those people because they're just going to toss you around. You go, to, you go right to the top. And if they don't let you go right to the top, get as close to the top as you can. Then you're talking to the right people who can at least get the message to the right person up there. And that's how many Christians operate. No, that's how they don't operate. They talk to the wrong people. The focus is in the wrong place. So the lesson really is how Elisha viewed the prophet Elijah. I wish I had. I'm smiling. I feel like a fool. I wish I had this insight when my husband passed away. So I could tell the people, your focus is in the wrong place. You're calling out for the servant. Look for the master. The master has never abandoned his people. The servants, generation after generation, 
he takes them. He doesn't let them live forever, and the only time they're memorialized forever is pretty much on the pages of this book or those who dwell in our hearts for the goodness they have planted by a seed of faith through the Word of God because of their fidelity to God's Word. That's it. So God had been, or whatever God had been to Elijah, Elisha was looking to that and essentially saying, Lord, give me the same power you gave your servant Elijah. And if you take a few steps back, I'll take us into the Bible in a minute, but I'm going to give a brief overview because some may be not so familiar with Elijah's uh, history. And for those who are, it's just a very quick review. What fascinates me is that Elijah basically appears out of nowhere on the pages of the Old Testament. And he appears at a time when Israel was under control of a wicked king by the name of Ahab, corrupt, and the Sidonian idolatress Jezebel, who basically, she wore the pants in that relationship, by the way. But the thing that's interesting is that this simple man, prophet of God, is thrust right into the middle of conflict and crisis. God doesn't say, I'm going to give you the time to catch up. In fact, if you start reading about him and you're familiar with him, he gets put in some pretty crazy predicaments early on. But he's thrust right into the middle of something which at first glance somebody would say, well, if God is who God is, wouldn't God prepare his servants better? And the answer is not if they're acting in faith, not if they're depending on him to be and to do and to act. Preparation, I'm all for preparation, but there's only so much preparation a person can do and no amount of preparation can prepare you for ministry. That's like saying no matter how many books you read about pregnancy and motherhood or fatherhood, that'll prepare you. No. Good luck. It, there, I don't think, you know, you can take what I'm saying, but the reality is that this man being put into this circumstance with incredible faith, by the way, incredible faith that when he spoke, because of the acts of the people, the heavens were shut up, it did not rain, the crops withered, and at the same mindset, mouth and faith when it was time, the Lord honored that individual, Elijah's faith, and opened up the heavens and let it rain, and harvest and crop came once more to the land. If you read his story, you know that God sent ravens to feed him, sent him to a widow's house where the meal and the oil did not fail, but was sufficient a provision for its time. And if time permitted me, I would go piece by piece through both Elijah and Elisha's life to show what is remarkable is that these are two people, two very different people. Elijah maybe stands for a more miraculous type of individual in God's book because if you think about it, it's Elijah that before any other person is granted this. Elijah is essentially given the keys to death because he brings back an individual who had already departed this earth. If you think about it, that's kind of staggering to be given that power to bring somebody back to this living life here. So they have different miracles and different ways about them. And Probably what I think is mind-blowing is that God takes these two men. One just appears on the pages. The chapter begins, I believe it's the 17th chapter, telling the story about Elijah, and he just appears. And the other one, Elisha, is seemingly, it looks like just a chance encounter that Elisha is there, and Elijah is told by God to go and name his successor Elisha, and he finds him but again, out of obscurity. And it seems like there are so many great lessons. I'm probably going to 
book are about a dozen of them right now. But what's remarkable to me is that Elisha was just about his business in the field. He didn't go to seminary. He wasn't practicing at learning about God's way. He was out there in the field. And God named that one and said, that's the one you're going to anoint as prophet in your stead. And there's something wonderful about this, because as I've prayed, and I'm guilty of this, I have prayed, Lord, be gracious to me that you would put somebody in my pathway in this ministry that I could, I know it's going to sound bad, you're all going to cringe, that I could groom for your specific time when that time is, but God doesn't do it that way. We know God doesn't do it that way. It never works out that way. You can lay all the plans, that's what I said, and God says, nope, I don't want to do it that way. You know that passage out of Ecclesiastes I've mentioned many times where it says God has placed eternity in their hearts? I'm convinced that as much as he's placed eternity in our hearts for those who he's opened our eyes and our ears, he's also placed the seed of the ones who he will call to fulfill that they will eventually step up to the plate. And maybe some will be called like Jonah and they'll go the other way for a time. But I believe when God has a plan, he gets his plan carried out one way or another. Now, he's not going to force you or force me. He gives us abundant chances. So there's all these neat little messages woven in here about the life of the people that God chooses. Now, what's amazing, I'm going to go back to Elijah for a minute, is... For a man who appears out of nowhere, thrust into the middle of this crisis, and I'm jumping far ahead into the story, and we find him gathered, he alone. This, this to me is like, you, you just have to stop and go, either God is a great storyteller, and he is, but also this is great faith, because one man stood in the name of his God, while 800 priests of Baal gathered to best the man of God, he stood alone. Mind you, he didn't really stand alone. God was with him, but visually he stood alone. And this kind of ties into many things I've been saying for the past few weeks. You're not alone. If you're walking with the Lord, you're not alone. You may not see, you may not hear an audible voice, but you're not alone. Elijah was not alone. And when he walked into that, we'll call it a lion's den, the 800 priests of Baal standing there ready, by the way. Their mindset was their, their God, Baal, is able. But we know how the story goes. And with the altar set and the water put in place and all of the unfolding of this, all of their calling and pleading was in vain. Nothing happened. We know the story. Remember, I'm, I'm going to lead you somewhere. You might not know what my message is right now, but it'll be clear when I'm done. So just follow me. When it was Elijah's turn, this is what I like. When it was his turn, he opened his mouth, and as quickly as a bolt and fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice and the water, and there is this momentous event that just happens in one fell swoop. And you can say, remember, I started by saying the God of Abraham, and I could have talked about the God of Moses, but the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, and the same God that raised up Christ from the dead shall so dwell in you, the same God of Elijah. The difference is his faith. He trusted that when God said something, God would make good. And there's nothing greater, I hate to say it, there's no greater validation that we don't have that same type of happening in our lives like the prophet did. But there's no, there could be no greater validation than watching these 800 priests of Baal parade around like a bunch of goonie birds and talk about the power of Baal. 
and one man, as brave as can be, saying, the Lord God, and calling at that moment, and that one singular voice getting the attention of God for God to do exactly what he said he would. There could be no greater vindication. Validation that I, if I was Elijah, I placed my life and my faith in the right place. But, you know, in our time, we don't have the things put on display that these folks did, but the same God is operating. And the requirement is eyes on the master, not on the servant. And the opportunities that we will miss if the eyes are not in the right place are astounding. Now, from this event that I just described, Elijah takes off, he girds his loins, he takes off, and he's running ahead. That must have been another interesting sight, because it says that he ran before Ahab, who was in his chariot with his horses. And that means either Ahab was just uh, happy trails to you going along, <laughs> or Elijah had some miraculous wind power behind him to make him get ahead and meet up with Ahab. You know, fine little miracles placed in there that you just kind of read and go, oh, okay. And I'm, I'm now going to pick up in the Bible where I just left off because I wanted to get past all of that to give you a place of departure, if you will. So if you'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 46. First Kings 18 and verse 46, and the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah, girded up his loins, ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how with all, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, because 800 are wiped out in a flash, these 800 priests of Baal. Again, one man against 800. Do you want to talk about some impossible odds and some discouraging, you know, if we were standing there, we, us, me, one against 800, how discouraging. But he knew in whose presence he stood. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now, up until this point, the prophet has not had any faltering. What I love is that God includes the faltering of even his best to show that no one's perfect, that he listened to this wicked Jezebel. In verse 3 says, And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. And he heard this thing. When you think about it, one against a hundred and a stupid, silly, wicked, probably crazy woman talks to him and it says, he arose and went for his life, came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under, under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. This is bewildering to me. But then again, nothing, I told you the things that we're looking at somebody's life on the pages of God's book, nothing makes sense. It makes no sense at all. He just had this incredible victory. God vindicated, put on display, did everything that he said, and he slew the prophets of Baal, and yet from one stinking word from this wicked woman, and he runs away into the wilderness and is requesting that God take his life. That's how delicate. And we're talking about a rugged, I've called him a rugged mountain man. That's how delicate life is. I really think God put this in here for us to see that even the greatest, the greatest sign and the greatest vindication and the greatest faith 
can falter. And in the faltering, stuff happens. And what I love about this is how tenderly God dealt with him. I think the prophet here, whether he succumbed to voices, a demon, fear, I don't know whether he had doubts in that. I don't know what it is. What I do know is the tenderness of God that he's under this juniper tree and again and again, God will minister to his weariness. That's grace and mercy abounding. It says, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came, sat down under a juniper tree, requested for himself that he might die, and said, it is enough now. O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. I want you to see how, and I use the word, it's tenderness. God could have said, get up. <laughs> get up, Elijah, now. An angel touched him. That's the tenderness of God. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And again, this ministering is going to continue until, until the prophet is rested, reposed, and fed, if you will. He, he's been provided for graciously by God. The angel of the Lord came again the second time, touched him, said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat, Forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. In other words, God said, I got something lined up for you ahead in the distance. I'm going to take care of you to make sure you get to where you need to go. In forty days, that, that sustained him for forty. Whether you believe that or not, I happen to believe it, which tells me that God knows when there's a tough trip ahead, which is an old message you've heard, Tough shoes for a tough trip, but God knows when the trip is tough. He knows how to get the provision to you and to me to make it so that we make it through. Now, maybe for us it would have been, well, Lord, can you pack a little doggy bag along the way so 40 days I won't be hungry? But this is the way God does it. He came thither unto a cave, lodged there, beheld the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, this is what is amazing. God gives to him in this moment... When, I, when I've prayed for this, but that hasn't happened yet. He gives him a commission. He says, you go and anoint Hazel. He'll be the king of Syria. You go anoint the king of Israel. And you go anoint this guy. You go find him. His name is Elisha because he's going to be a prophet in your place. I mean, I have to confess to you, I, you know, I wish that God would do that for me so I could know because I want to take care and make sure the ministry's taken care of and everything's good. Maybe God's saying, I'm not telling you anything because I'm not ready. Don't bother me, right? <laughs> but you can't blame a girl for trying. <laughs> but this is what I love about this. And here is probably the meat of the message, and then I'll continue, but I want you to see what I'm going to say. Was it at the point where Elijah maybe in his spirit said, I am tired and I don't want to do this because I'm the only one left. I don't want to do this. Maybe God said, okay, I got a final commission for you and then I'll find somebody else. Your opportunity maybe to do more has been forfeited. I'm not suggesting that because God was gracious to take him up in a chariot and a whirlwind in a chariot. He didn't die a death like all the others in the Bible did, save Enoch. He didn't die. He was taken up. But the question is, 
when he got tired in his spirit, and maybe he lamented, it's like a person I once knew who was in the ministry who said, boy, I'm really worn out and tired from having to deal with all these people. They just suck the life out of me, and I wish to God that God would just, you know, fix the problems and bring somebody to take my place because they really wanted to be out of the ministry. They weren't thinking about the future of the ministry. They were thinking about their future. They wanted out of the ministry. And I really believe that God will always oblige. There, there's never going to be another you. God's called you to do certain things. But on the flip side, if all you do is lament about how much you do for him or how tired you are about doing it, instead of saying the grace of God that I can stand here and talk to you and the grace of God that he give me another Sunday to be with you, another time to come together instead of lamenting and complaining and looking at all the half-empty glass problems that exist, saying the Lord will make a way. It's the Lord's work. It's his problem. Lord, I know you see it all. Help me to make it. Give me the provision and the people and the, and the Lord did it for Elijah. I'm thinking maybe there'll be a time where that's my case, but if it's not, I've got the wagon wheel right here that God gave him, the prophet Elijah, final commission. Said, you go and, you go and anoint the king of Syria, you go and anoint the next king of Israel, and you go and anoint your successor. Now, Elisha didn't have the same type of ministry as Elijah did. This is the other thing that I wish people would actually be people of the book instead of people who think they're people of the book because very seldomly are two ministers ever alike. God will usually put his twist and his stamp of uniqueness. He's not into cookie-cutting ministers or saints. Like you get go in the machine and you go in looking one way and you come out looking another. Well, if you've done that, that's your problem, not God's. It's like Dan sings that song, Sister Sal. You know, go cut your hair, go put on a nice outfit, go do this and that. Well, that's the cookie cutter. Only God can fix the inside. That's his specialty. And the outside, if you're so busy looking at the outside of the container, again, you've got your eyes on the servant and not the master, which is why you're not going to get the help you need because you're not talking to the right person and you're not even looking in the right place. Help, I need help. might be under here somewhere, I don't know what I'm, you know, it might be, uh, the help might be under here, it might be under there, everywhere but, like Ephesians 2, 4, but God, who is rich in mer mercy, wherewith he loved us, any place but the master, right? So God gives him this commission, and he basically tells him what to do, and you pick up the... Uh, story of Ahab and Ahab's end and the beginning of Elisha and his ministry, which is, I want to keep going on this and I'll come back to make my point once more. But if you keep spinning forward a little bit in your Bibles, you find in 1 Kings 22, keep turning. You read about Ahab's demise. You know, some, it, it doesn't really say too much except some guys pulling his bow back and strings released, and Ahab's. Garmin is open just in the right place, and boom, that's it. It's all over in a flash. This is the other thing. Friends, I mean, listen, I've had to deal with a lot of crazy stuff in the last couple of years, but there is one thing I have come to know. The Lord will take care of the people who try to prevent God's servants and his plan and his purpose. The Lord will take care. This is why when the scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, you got to just have the spirit of Elijah to say, that is where I'm going to stand. God's going to take care. 
And something interesting about this um, person, Elisha, I'll tell you what it is. He was out there doing his own thing, minding his own business. He didn't say, oh, put me in ministry. Oh, I'm signing up to be a minister. Sign me up. I always wanted that, but, you know, God wouldn't ordain me. <laughs> Couldn't resist. He was out there just doing his thing. And along comes the prophet Elijah to really mess up Elisha's life by telling him he's got this commission and the cloak and mantle falls on him. And this is what I love about God's word. Elisha didn't have any real problems until his mentor, his spiritual father, his spiritual friend is taken up and his first test is to cross over the Jordan. This is, again, there are a thousand messages inside this one message. Let's call Elisha a type of a spirit-filled believer. His first encounter his first test is against something that is seemingly in the eyes of the onlookers, those uh, brethren of Bethel that are looking on saying, ah, oh, yeah, watch this guy. Watch this clown try and cross over there. He's probably going to kill himself in the midst. And the test, well, the test was pretty, to me, seems pretty simple. Are you going to trust God to take you through? You know, a lot of people say Jordan is a type of death. I, I'm sorry, I don't buy that either. But what didn't come to meet him, his first real challenge of faith, wasn't a band of angels saying, come on, Elisha, you can do it, come on. <laughs> it was a flooded Jordan that he had to cross over. There's his first challenge, which means, I've said this to you before, God's going to put some challenges in your way. It's not just going to be tempted by the devil. You're going to have some challenges to overcome. And believe me, when Elisha went over, those eyeballs on the other side probably saying, yeah, look at that idiot, suddenly bowed themselves in front of him saying, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Why? Because he was calling on the master, not the servant. He wasn't saying at the, at the very edge of Jordan, he wasn't saying, oh, if only Elijah was here. If only Elijah was here, he would help get me over because he knew what to do. He knew to call on the God of Elijah. And that's in the strength and the power. That's how he went across. Elisha's life represents something that is unique. His miracles are unique. But all of this is to say God has a way, his mercies which endure and are abundantly beyond and above what we can imagine if our eyes are fixed in the right place. I know what happens. People say, you know, well, I have a need. I have a need for healing, for example. And I've been sick these many years and the Lord hasn't healed me yet. I want you to take a look at what it took for Naaman to get cleansed from his leprosy. It wasn't the touch of the prophet. It was being obedient to God's word. That It took Naaman to really listen because his, the first instructions are, go wash seven times. And he says, but aren't the waters of essentially of where I am just as good? No, go wash in the place that I told you, dunk seven times. And of course, you know the story. It wasn't the touch of the prophet. All of these teach something. The word of God. And by the way, there were people even in Jesus' day. How about the woman that came 18 years, bent over? Remarkably, I think something, there's something there. She wasn't out in the street. She was bent over in the synagogue. 
So it's not, it's not like this is a woman who is void of understanding that God is able, but hearing the master speak, that's a whole different thing right there. Not eyes on the servant, eyes, in this case, the woman had her eyes on the Lord. The God of, as I said, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, keep going. Look at all the people in the Bible. Same God, different people. God carrying out his way, his way, through these different people. And this is why that wonderful passage in Hebrews 11 we call the heroes of faith. Why? By faith, by faith, by faith. Not by perfection, not by works, by faith. And the God of Elisha, who is the same God, is the same God today when you talk about how God can enter into something. And he can. Does he always? Because that's, that's the million dollar question. Some people become disheartened when God doesn't answer. Remember what I told you about Paul. Paul sought the Lord three times it says that the Lord would remove that thorn, which I've told you many times, I do not believe to be ophthalmia or eye disease, but a guilty conscience of what he had done to the church of God before the Lord took him on the Damascus Road and blinded his eyes to give him a new eyesight, new vision, and a commission for Christ. It says he asked the Lord three times, and the Lord didn't. He didn't take it away. I firmly believe this unequivocally, that the reason why the Lord didn't take that away is that what, that's what kept Paul's feet on the ground. But interesting, sometimes God has a reason for not. But even in the not, in the not removing, in the not responding, God is there. You might say, well, then what type of a message are you preaching? I'm preaching one that says the same God that has a track record, if we're combing and looking, is the same God that's alive and interacting with us in this time to give us the same type of hope and courage that when life tumbles in and we suddenly forget for a moment that there is a God in heaven that the one named Jesus Christ is not some mythical invention of later times, including some people who have said it's an invention of Paul, which is quite interesting. But rather, God is and still is. The God who created everything, the God of all creation, the God who called you, who formed you. I think all of these people in the Bible give us insight for the many who... We read and we say, God spoke and called someone from the womb. I was talking about Jacob and Esau, and it says that God spoke to them or about them from the womb, much like Jeremiah. And I believe that that ability, if you will, for God to know, for God to see, means God's got the power, sufficiently able, by the way, if we creatures will call on him. That doesn't mean because I say, God, I need provision, that suddenly I'll go outside and I'll take my, my green garbage bag and the Lord will open the sky and all the, all the money and all the coin that I need will fill the bag because I asked, I, special person here, asked the Lord and the Lord said, for your special prayer today, <laughs> right? No, it doesn't work like that. But I want you to think of the prophet who God's grace to give him provision in his weariness and to give him rest, to let him rest and to give him provision in his weariness and to feed him to say, the journey's going to be tough for 40 days. This is going to have to sustain you. That's the type of provision I'm talking about when I talk about provision or the widow's meal and oil. Not the way it's caricatured by these charlatan crazy people out there who say, well, you know, the Lord's going to provide and he's going to pour out a blessing you can't contain, so you better open up your pockets and everything else. Some of that needs to be shut anyway. 
but he meets our needs. The caution here is this. If the eyes aren't, and we're talking about people who claim to be people of the book, the God of the Bible is the God that is with us today, Emmanuel. And I was talking about healing. I mentioned Naaman as a type. But just turn into the New Testament and see even the smallest and the all but brief, two verses on Peter's mother-in-law laying sick with a fever. It just so happens that the Lord just happened to be in town, right? Just happened that way. Just miraculously happened. He just happened to be, oh, look, Jesus is here. Come on in, Jesus. My mother-in-law is sick with a fever over there, right? The Lord knows. Our healing doesn't come like some people make a caricature and say, there are, are there some people who are healed and raised up right away? Yes. Dr. Scott's father, Pop Scott, used to tell his testimony, being raised out of a coma and all the wonderful things the Lord did for him. But does the Lord do that for everybody that particular way? No, I believe some get up in faith even though their body is still diseased and still hurting and they get up in faith and they act as though the Lord has already and as they go, like that passage in Psalm 105 where it says, you know, there wasn't a feeble one in the midst. Well, we know that God healed them on their way out. If they had an ailment, if they had something, when they were leaving, they were fortified. They were healed. In fact, it says the Lord sent his word and healed them all. But that would require eyes focused on and ears listening to the master and not some Sidebar. That's why I say look beyond. You have an under-shepherd here, someone who cares. I've told you I'm here to open up the Word of God, but I'm not here as a middleman. I'm here to open up the Word and get you to focus, build up your faith. And I'm not suggesting that we're going to always have perfect faith, which is why I mentioned the faltering. One episode in Elijah's life where f for some reason, whatever it is, he wants to go under a tree momentarily, loses his sanity, whatever you want to call it. And by the way, it's extremely timely because I started by mentioning how people say, well, how can a person who has everything contemplate taking their life? Well, how can a person who just won a victory over the priests of Baal, who just was vindicated by God, who basically has had all these incredible miracles being fed by birds and God tells him to go over here and gives him the direction and all of this stuff and then he wants to go and die. That makes no sense to me. I could understand if God said, here, here's half of the map. <laughs> I could understand going to find a juniper tree. But God doesn't work that way does take standing on God's word and recognizing he's more than able. His provision is sufficient. It may not be the thing we actually think we need. What has been the message underneath many, many giving messages that I've taught over the years? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and then all the other things that you need will be added. And they may not be the things that you, you think you need. It's the things he knows that you need. There's a big difference. What I love is that God did not leave the people without a prophet. He just gave a different type of prophet. And Elijah's, Elijah's, Elisha's miracles have some beautiful woven, what I've called New Testament tapestry. They're on their way to do something. They're going to chop down some wood, the axe head that falls into the water, which is a type of the resurrection of Christ, and a supernatural against nature to make an axe head float, which means not, God, not only is God the God of nature and creation, but he's also in charge, by the way, I know you're going to hate what I'm going to say. He made these laws somehow in nature, and he can also change them. <laughs> That's why we, I preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the law of man's sin, for sin comes death, but the law of God says 
in faith, by faith in Christ, death has no more dominion. Well, that's completely insane for the natural person, but this is the way God does it. And Elisha's given miracle after miracle. I'd say it like this. Elijah's miracles are more man of fire. They're more out there, whereas Elisha's miracles are right down there with the common man and woman for immediate application. But no matter what, neither one of these men were focused on the self. Neither one of these men ever cried out and said about the other reliance, oh, that I had the power of Elijah, but rather, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And I would say to you today, he's here. I don't know why we waste so much time, and we do, and time is so precious for us here on earth, why we waste so much time looking in the wrong place for help and trying to find help everywhere but focused on the master. As I said, the Lord knew exactly what would be needed if he took up his servant Elijah, that there would be need for another. And he couldn't clone Elijah, but he found somebody out there with a heart that only he knows that, that once the call came and the commitment was there, he used that vessel. Now, if there's something to take away from this message today, it is God is able. There can never be a problem that you in your eyes or mine in mine think is too great or even too petty for God to solve. For that to happen says there is no hope. And all of these people who have stood and said, in the power, in the name of God, in the name of the Lord thy God, in the name of the God of Elijah and of Elisha and of, and name them all, means that God is no longer God if you can't call on God. And maybe, as I said, maybe the same miracles are not happening as they did. But the miracle of calling on the Master same principle applies. There isn't anything that's impossible with God. On the flip side, we need to not become tired or treat the things that we've been privileged to do casually. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that Elijah just summarily said, well, I'm tired of being a prophet, and I'm tired of all these great victories and battles, so, you know, maybe God will find a replacement. But I want you to indulge the thought process because the thought process is a lot of people get real casual and they get real tired about whether it's doing the ministry as in the pulpit or the work that goes into the ministry or whether it's just simply trying to learn about God. People get tired and they say, you know, this is too much effort, requires too much of me. Be careful because the same God that's listening as you petition and as you ask who's able to provide, who's able to heal, who's able to make a way. It's the same God, as I've said, who I'm not saying this happened, but I'm, I am saying we need to treat our calling carefully. He's able to say, okay, I've got, I got somebody else over here. I made them all, all, all souls are mine. I made them all. Now, that guy over there is not going to do the same thing that I had for you to do because I had a special job for you and you don't want to do it. So... He'll do something else that may be similar, and she might do something else, and it might be similar, but the rewards that you might have gotten for doing those specific things that I had assigned to you will be forfeited. Now, people may not like what I'm saying. This is why we have to look at the source of our strength and a God who has not changed. A God who has not changed and from, from the beginning of time has put up with so much craziness. The question is, why do we waste time trying to find another solution or wandering around, or maybe it's even becoming prodigal enough because we've been disillusioned that we wander away for a while and we can't figure out there is a way back. It's the same way you started by faith. And it's the same principle as Elijah standing as one man against a 
800, or as one man alone in the wilderness. My God is able. Get to the point where in the week, maybe it's, maybe it's tomorrow, maybe it's tonight, where you just say, I just don't know how I'm going to get through this. Stop yourself for a minute. Put a couple of verses together. The first one is, but God, who is rich in mercy, wherewith he loved us, knowing our frame, but God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Moses, the God that showed himself, and I would say the God of me and the God of you, that same God who is alive, interceding, ever liveth to make it intercession for us hears and knows. And then wait until the morning because his mercies are new each day. With a new day comes new grace, new fortitude, and new strength. And you remember that these people here, they didn't, that I've talked about, they did not possess some special power like we tend to paint them as special people. Yet they were chosen vessels of God Men and some women, just like you and me, who had the courage to take God at his word even when the picture didn't look real good, or in Elijah's case, as I mentioned, when it all looked good and for a moment he faltered, which is completely natural for any person who's going to walk any amount of time and get tired. The Lord is able. There are no problems that God can't solve. And we've said this many times here before, we do serve the God of impossibilities. I think that's his specialty, the things that you and I can't absolutely wrap our mind around or, or fix. He specializes in that, and he helps you and he helps me through. He only asks one thing, stand in faith, take him at his word which has been established in heaven, and don't quit, at least don't quit today, tomorrow's a new day. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.